chairman of the pro industry division Northwest Centre, and I would like to thank you for attending this lecture. The duration of the lecture will be about 40 minutes, followed with 15 minutes of questions. If you have any questions, will you please put them in the question box during the lecture and Oliver QT, our secretary, will field them after the lecture. Will you all please switch off your microphones during the lecture? The lecture will show the potential electricity that could be generated if suitable barrages were installed across all appropriate estuaries around the UK. It will show the approximate timescales and costs of each of them and how it compares with the current electricity being generated from fossil fuels. Our speaker is Professor George Agidas, who is the head of en energy engineering at Lancaster University. He's been heavily involved with potential tidal energy for over 15 years, as I know. George has become quite an authority on this subject, and he is very qualified to deliver this lecture today. So ladies and gentlemen, your speaker for today, Professor George Agidas. George, over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, David, for this uh, kind introduction. I'll try to uh, uh, share my screen now. Is uh, can everybody see my screen? OK. Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. yes. OK, thank you very much. OK, so uh, today uh, we are going to cover a tidal range energy opportunity for the whole of the UK. Uh, David uh, has been uh, uh, quite a, a strict taskmaster and uh, the IMA key has given me uh, uh, questions to oops questions that uh, uh, are quite encompassing and uh, I would have thought that will really require uh, quite in-depth uh, research following uh, this uh, lecture to take everything to the next steps but I try to do my best to answer all these five questions. The first one, which UK estuaries are suitable for tidal range schemes? How much electricity can be generated using tidal range? Uh, what are the costs of tidal range projects? When could uh, tidal range power be delivered? And where should the tidal range sit in uh, uh, terms of UK uh, generating options? Just a couple of slides uh, to as an introduction of uh, where I am and uh, where everything is taking place. Uh, as uh, David said, uh, I'm the head of energy uh, engineering at Lancaster University. This is one of the few buildings that we occupy as engineering at Lancaster University. Uh, and uh, we have uh, labs and we carry out uh, research on uh, not only on energy and renewable energy, but also on fluid machinery and uh, uh, new technol technology ideas. And we are funded by EPSRC, Carbon Trust, EU, RDAs, utilities and industry. And just uh, to show you in one slide some of the specialized facilities we have, uh, you can see here uh, some of uh, the low head hydro uh, facilities uh, we have available. These uh, are in uh, uh, here on the bottom left hand side in uh, the and also on the top hand side uh, facilities we have uh, in uh, the in one of the buildings. Uh, the you can see the wave tank uh, facility and uh, the low head hydro facility and on the right hand side top and bottom is uh, the current building that I showed you uh, pictures of and we are expanding by next June we'll have another new building and new labs available uh, for our students and staff to use. 
So, uh, talking about Tidal, it's a resource that uh, really uh, depends on uh, the gravitational fields of Earth, Moon and Sun. And as long as the Earth, the Moon and the Sun continue on uh, the uh, relative orbit, we'll always have uh, a tidal resource. As you can see, uh, this uh, resource is uh, uh, cyclical and can be modeled uh, on red. On this uh, graph, you can see the twice daily ebb flood, monthly lunar cycles, in seasonal cycles, and sprint and nip. And on blue, these are actual data measured. And you can see that they follow very, very closely the model. Everything is the, the variations you see between uh, the uh, red uh, lines and the blue lines is just due to atmospheric pressure, wind and climate change. But results are largely predictable. So uh, we can uh, long into the future. We, we know exactly what were the tides yesterday and tomorrow. Uh, and we know exactly what were the tides thousand years ago and thousand years in the future. Now uh, looking into the UK tidal resource, uh, we can see uh, on the left hand side uh, the three hotspots with green circles uh, for tidal stream where we use hydrokinetics and the kinetic energy of uh, the water to generate energy. And on the right hand side uh, you can see uh, the tidal range resource that is predominantly on uh, the west coast of uh, England uh, and uh, the British Isles. And you can see that half of it is uh, in uh, the uh, Bristol estuary and half of it just around Lancaster where we are in the northwest from uh, uh, North Wales up to the lower end of uh, Scotland. Technologies uh, we have in our arsenal uh, series of uh, uh, well proven designs on the left hand side. We have uh, the bulb Kaplan turbines that can operate uh, for very high efficiencies up to 90 mid 90s all the way to the other end the newly developed uh, open stream tidal uh, current turbines that obviously they are restricted by the batch limit and i guess from the best efficiencies we have seen up to now are mid 50s uh, mid 40s to 50 uh, percent and Somewhere in the middle, we have other technologies uh, that, uh, as an example, I put this uh, Rolls-Royce uh, contra-rotating idea uh, that uh, efficiency-wise fits somewhere in uh, the two extremes. And you can see that uh, uh, moving from right to left, we have increasing environmental impact and moving from left from left to right we have a decreasing power density high efficiencies lower efficiencies and where do we have references around the world so uh, in europe uh, we have uh, laurens and this is france's cheapest electricity uh, according to EDF engineers on their fleet uh, and has been operated uh, for operating since uh, the 60s at 240 megawatts. Uh, in Canada, the Annapolis project, the Bay of Fundy, with the highest uh, tidal range, 16.2 meters uh, on the world. Second is uh, here in the UK, the Bristol Channel. It has been decommissioned after 34 years of operation. 
it was relatively smaller at 20 megawatts. You can see it here. And the newest and largest on the world today is the Siwa project in South Korea that has been 10 years in operation to date and it's 254 megawatts. And Lancaster University has been very closely linked to the development of this. Uh, and obviously there are few others as well. In uh, uh, the 80s, uh, there was a development in Russia of uh, Kislagia Guba and a series of uh, uh, smaller uh, tidal range projects in uh, China. Now, this is a very, since we are talking about the UK, this is a very important uh, slide. Please remember it because it will be useful to remember these numbers for the remaining of uh, the discussion uh, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, the installed capacity in uh, the UK is 76.6 gigawatts. The annual generation is 308.7 terawatts, but the demand is 334.2. So because of this shortfall here, we have to import about 28.7 terawatts. So please remember this number, uh, installed capacity 76.6 gigawatts and our current demand 334.2. And looking at the approximate breakdown by source, we can see that almost half is gas, 48%, with 60% uh, uh, wind, uh, nuclear, 15%, and then smaller percentages, biomass, coal, uh, coal solar, imports, hydro, and storage, which means that's August 2022, which means that uh, there is a massive gap to fill with uh, wind. There is no conflict with nuclear uh, and uh, introduce significant amount of tidal and still have left gas to balance the grid. Now, looking at uh, the past, the primary energy mix in the UK, uh, you can see coal, oil, natural gas increasing, uh, nuclear slightly decreasing, and the introduction of bioenergy, hydro, wind, solar, and imports here. And this is all energy. But if we focus on uh, electricity, uh, you can see uh, the, the chart here at the bottom right hand side where you can see that the coal is almost disappearing. Oil the same. Gas is remains significant. Nuclear slightly reduced from 24% down to 15% here. Uh, and then uh, uh, you can see the introduction of wind and solar and others. And at the same time, the graph here is dipping down. And we can see that uh, our electricity use has declined since the peak of 2005 despite the fact that uh, we have a population increase. And this is because of energy efficiency regulations, energy efficient lighting, changing consumer hab habits, and including the continuing decline of heavy industry here in the UK. Now, in uh, looking at the UK electricity supply mix 2019, we can see here nuclear and biomass uh, provide uh, base load. Wind and solar fully utilized when available. Uh, pump storage used for peak demand and interconnectors, hydro, seasonal, coal and gas, ECGT are used to satisfy the remaining demand. Uh, when uh, no sand and wind compensate by burning gas. So even if we install more solar and wind, uh, capacity does not change this without an alternative approach. And tidal 
could fit that bill. Now, back in 2009, the government uh, through uh, UK ERC uh, had uh, the project uh, UK ERC Energy 2050. Uh, we were looking into the future, and uh, this pro it's one of many studies, but this specific one addressed uh, the two government toughest energy policy goals to deliver reliable energy to, con uh, to consumers while meeting the legal commitment that uh, we placed uh, ourselves as a government uh, to reduce CO2 emissions by 80% by 2050. And the conclusions were these four bullet points, decarbonize electricity totally by 2050, improve energy efficiency, i.e. reduce use, change lifestyles and early action is essential. This is back in 2019. And uh, since then, if we look at what is happening now, these bullet points appear happening. I we take action based on uh, the guidelines of this uh, and other studies. But back in 2019, the UK Energy 2050 also said, which is very. Uh, <laughs> Serious and important today, major gas shocks could have cost impacts measured in billions, mainly through lost supplies to industrial consumers. More investment in gas storage or imported facilities could mitigate these impacts. But unfortunately, our gas storage facilities here in the UK have shrunk. Over the years, We've seen a lot of government papers, government white papers. Our uh, continued appropriate ambition, we have uh, the 2003, 2007, 2020 energy white papers. We have legislation and plans for Cri Climate Change Act, 2008, uh, the Low Carbon Transition Plan, 2009, the Energy Bill, 2012 to 13. But no serious consideration is given for tidal rains, and that's serious. Looking at the electricity generation and usage uh, in uh, terawatt hours in uh, 2021, we can see uh, uh, at the top end nuclear and renewables, and the lower end petroleum, thermal, and other sources, natural gas and coal. Now, all this, unfortunately, generate a lot of losses. Conversion, transmission and distribution losses. So over half the energy used is lost. And looking at uh, uh, Dukes, you can see where financiers uh, have a look at these graphs. We look at the thermal inefficiencies and we can see that uh, hydro, pump storage, wind, solar, they are 100% here, while everything else, uh, including gas and nuclear, are less than 50. And as we know, use it or lose it with electricity, uh, uh, the percent used, again, you can see the 100% on uh, pump storage, wind, solar and renewables and less than 100% on anything else. Again, straight from Dukes. Also for uh, energy uh, generation, we need to look into the electricity network and we can see that uh, uh, we have to be near to major power lines and connectors and this is essential. So uh, this is good for the hotspots where we have tidal resource. In addition, it's good because we have demand nearby as well with uh, large uh, cities, towns. Looking at the global picture, where tidal energy resource 
is available, we can see that Britain has a very strong position. And uh, uh, you can see some points uh, in uh, Russia, Kislaya Guba, I did mention the Siwa project in uh, South Korea, some of the Chinese projects, Australia, India. Uh, you can see the Annapolis here, uh, resource uh, just in uh, Mexico, just below uh, California, and some in uh, at the bottom of Latin America. But as you can see, our uh, UK resource, it's very interesting. Uh, we have uh, probably uh, the best resource in the whole of almost half of the resource of uh, the in uh, the Europe. Uh, 48% and the majority of the resource is on the west coast of the British Isles. And just uh, to go through quickly, uh, where could tidal range schemes be built? If we start with uh, uh, 2007, we had uh, the seven report and uh, turning the tide, tidal power in uh, the UK, uh, that uh, came up with exactly the hotspots that we should be uh, looking for tidal energy and the seven uh, being the second highest uh, resource on the world. Uh, then in uh, 2011, uh, we have uh, the uh, ETI report Black and Beach came with the tidal resource characterization and feasible, feasible schemes report. And we have specifics on the projects that could be uh, taken forward on uh, lagoons and barrages around the UK. Uh, moving on, uh, in uh, 2013, through uh, funding from the Jewel Center that I was very, very close at the time on, uh, I was on the board of the Jewel Center. Uh, my good friends uh, Richard Barrows and uh, Judith Wolf in uh, Liverpool uh, came up with uh, uh, the projects that uh, could be taken forward and including smaller ones like the wire you can see here that's uh, Fleetwood and across to the golf course you can see Morgan Bay here uh, Liverpool uh, we can have approximately 15% of UK capacity. Of course, right at the bottom right hand side, you can see Thames in London. This is the Thames barrier, only flood protection and an opportunity missed. Uh, Richard Barrows again back in 2009 uh, has carried out studies looking into the operation of 7D, Mokan Bay, Solway and Messi, and the complementarity of each one of these uh, uh, projects uh, to smooth out uh, the power output into the national grid. And moving forward again, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, Charles Henry came up the, with the role of tidal lagoons. And Hen the Henry report said that 37 gigawatts capacity from 18 sites and four sites in the northwest of England, 50% of the UK current capacity. But the outcome was not positive about current proposals. Uh, you can see here a list of uh, the 37 gigawatts and the uh, places uh, where we could place uh, a tidal plant uh, according to the Henry report. But again, offshore lagoons, and you can see here uh, an idea uh, between uh, England and Scotland at the Solway uh, estuary that no one has assessed their potential so far. So uh, Charles Henry came up with uh, uh, 
very positive conclusions about uh, uh, Tidal uh, and uh, the fact that the theoretical scale of opportunity in the UK is around 37 gigawatts out of 18 potentially feasible schemes, and we can generate 55 terawatt hours of electricity. That's 17% of our current usage. And moving forward, another project I have been involved with uh, uh, this uh, uh, paper uh, on renewable energy with uh, Simon Neal. Uh, we came up with the conclusion that a total potential energy of 336 terawatt hours per annum is found in UK waters. And if you remember my earlier slide, uh, where I showed you the uh, current use and demand here in the UK, this represents 111% of our current uh, demand. So resource-wise, we have more than uh, we require here in the UK just from Tidal. Looking at the wholesale electricity prices, just to give you another point there, uh, you can see straight from Alexon, uh, you can see that uh, uh, before 2021, uh, we are about average of 45 pounds per megawatt hour. In 2021 is the post-COVID bounce, and we have an increase. And from 2022, we see that the, through putting a special military operation, we see almost doubling. Just to put this into perspective, the Swansea Bay CFD, it was 95 pounds per megawatt hour. So situation changes rapidly. Uh, because of the importance of Tidal, and uh, I have been a member of the British Hydropower Association probably for many, many years, uh, we developed the Tidal Range Alliance. And the mission is to promote and the multidisciplinary features and benefits of tidal range projects to key stakeholder sectors across government, industry, and the media. It has key messages like multifunctional, multigenerational uh, benefits beyond energy alone, security, stability, sustainability, and contribution to decarbonization, and geographical spread of projects. Also, it uh, states uh, current projects that are under development with uh, costs power and years of construction, uh, which is uh, uh, fine with me. Uh, perhaps uh, the sum for construction is a bit over optimistic. It suggests that uh, in uh, seven years uh, we could have 13 gigawatts of uh, tidal power, which in my view, it's uh, not feasible and we need to put a more realistic value here that is significantly higher. And uh, looking at the barriers, the way that uh, uh, BHA TRA are looking at, the industry, its investors and supply chain remain in a state of readiness, but unable to progress until government includes tidal range within policy. Uh, base accepting of well-developed, uh, yeah, value for money proposals, but have not yet defined these statements. And the industry requires early development funding in order to uh, leverage billions of private sector investment. Uh, this is an ask from the industry of uh, the UK government, uh, much in line with what we have recently seen with the tidal stream. Now, uh, the Lancaster University view on uh, time frame, uh, and we have put it in six steps here. Uh, step one, initial examination, we put it as two to three years. Detail analysis and food co full costings, two to three years. Planning, approval five, construction development eight, deployment eight, making a total of 18 years for a plan that is operational for 130 years and five years decommissioning. 
but if we take on board the current work that is taking place at Lancaster University uh, and also reduction of planning approvals at uh, uh, government level, we can increase this 18 to 11. Some, uh, most of the projects probably uh, have not passed uh, level one. Perhaps some, not many, level two. Uh, one went into uh, Swansea Bay, uh, step three, but not completely. And this is the situation in the UK today. So, our objectives from power. We have to look into sustainability, zero carbon, independence from international independence from international markets, balance of supply and storage. We can go beyond power and look into other functions. And we could look into environmental and socioeconomic. So environmental, we could look into carbon emission reduction. Uh, flood protection, which is very serious. Uh, and this includes sea level rise. Habitat creation management and species conservation. And on socioeconomic jobs, transport, power management. And grid network connections, recreation and tourism. Here you can see some research uh, I have done it uh, uh, with uh, some uh, architects at uh, uh, the University of Liverpool and produced on this paper on the public available in the public domain for the Messi project project. So looking at the uh, latest relevant research here at uh, Lancaster University, uh, we are looking to Lancaster zero D generation model and the Lancaster cost model. And uh, pretty soon they will be available on the public domain. Uh, Lancaster zero D generation model is being prepared, probably uh, will be ready in early in January uh, 2023. Uh, a model of cost for tidal range power generation schemes is in press uh, due to be published imminently. Uh, from the ICE Energy. The value of tidal range power generation is submitted to ICE and uh, the, a comparison between estuarine barrages and coastal lagoons, and here we compared Mokan Bay and North Wales, uh, is already published available online, uh, open access from Helion. Uh, and uh, for the Lancaster zero D generation model, uh, we use underpinning data, turbine efficiency hill chart and water, tidal cycle timing and head and bathymetry. And the variables we use turbine size, number operation, flood depth or two way double triple regulation and pumping, uh, generator rating and sluices. And for the Lancaster cost model, uh, uh, we use five key parameters, uh, which are the turbo generating equipment, powerhouse, sluices, coffee dam, and punt costs. As I said, all this will be, uh, are and will be uh, imminently uh, available on the public domain. So, where does UK tidal range power sit? If we look at risk, handle rates and decisions, what investors expect to risk before they will invest, uh, balance risk, competing opportunities, inflation, interest rates, etc., and sometimes seem counterintuitive, re intuitive, rejecting larger projects with higher uh, total returns. And here, at Lancaster University and all of us, we need to include more economists. Looking at the levelized cost of energy 
and the technology specific uh, hurdle rates from 2018 still complicated and still no tidal barriers. Uh, Quasi Quateng, then Chancellor suggested that Sonji Bay would be, and he said something between 8%, so it should be in that region there. But at the same time, we need to uh, consider other issues. Questions are not simple. Uh, energy generation may be compromised by conservation, flood protection, management, recreation requirements, and all these need to be costed. Silver rise is a major issue that threatens all estuaries and coastlines. Multifactional benefits need to be properly valued. We need to include transport, economy, employment, pollution, etc. And consider the nexus of our requirements. So we need to look into our water systems, food systems and energy systems that are all interrelated. So we have negatives and positives. Negatives, it hasn't happened yet. It's low on the finances lists. And there are still concerns about the environment. Positives, power generation may not be the main driver now. Uh, sea level rise needs an urgent response, and is happening. The IMAQ produced a report on that. Protecting habitats and species reverses conservation concerns. It can help the environment rather than be a concern to the environment, especially the ability not only to use turbining, but also pumping. So, in total, it's gaining popularity. And conclusions. Needs to be thought of as part of the UK's whole energy system. You see, we have the resource to produce 111% of our current demand here in the UK. But, uh, looking at a holistic system, as I described earlier, uh, there is room to reduce the 50% of gas we have today and bring it down, still have gas to balance the grid, but uh, start incorporating, uh, let's say, 10 and rise it to 20, 25% of uh, uh, Tidal for security. So we end up with perhaps four or five different uh, energy uh, resources here in the UK. We need to look into multifunctional, so other benefits must be costed, socioeconomic environment. And research is ongoing, uh, and definitely Lancaster University and other research centers in the UK and abroad are progressing with that, but we still need more construction options, environmental consequences, and economic and political research. What can we do? We need robust and sound research, both focusing on the engineering and its interactions with other disciplines. Publish beyond standard scientific literature. Seek funding to address questions such as the brief that the IMAQ has given me today. Press the politicians to support and co-fund a proof of concept barras here in the UK. And really, we need to act now. Because even if we press the button now, it will never happen overnight. It can take years as I described. So uh, acting now, it's uh, of paramount importance. Thank you very much for listening. All right. Thank you very much, George, for your interesting talk and uh, very, very interesting and 
I, I, I can refer to your talk as uh, of, uh, of food for thought because uh, th there are prospects of renewable energy, you know, in the United Kingdom and Tida, the Tida uh, energy uh, promises to be one of the key things that we need to focus on. Um, yeah, so uh, if you have any questions, please leave your questions on the chat box. Uh, so I have this question for, from Mark. So he says, how long will it be before a Tida power generation project is technically ready for commercial exploitation? How long will it be uh, before a Tida energy could be ready? Uh, this is uh, uh, a question that uh, I already answered through the uh, slides that uh, I have put forward. Uh, if uh, there is uh, a political will to progress with one project, uh, you have seen that uh, uh, the time duration uh, that uh, its project has estimated it will take around the UK uh, to uh, so we can take it forward. So uh, looking at uh, the uh, an average of seven years, just without looking into specific projects, might be uh, a good number to use to take things forward. This is why I said action is needed now. Yeah. Uh, if we want to take advantage of uh, tidal rains, because it's a resource that is available to us, is our under con our own control, provides security of supply, uh, it's renewable, predictable, and really we have to get away from difficult handshakes with friendly and unfriendly uh, neighbors around the world uh, to uh, start uh, asking to import more gas. Uh, and if we can control it and for future generations, uh, it will be great. The difficulty so far has been the fact that our uh, uh, politicians here in the UK uh, are not so far forward thinking and they are only having a very short vision that stops within the cycle of the next election and perhaps stops one year before the following election. And so four years is just too short time to actually develop uh, a, a serious infrastructure for the UK that uh, will produce uh, a plant uh, that it will be for 120 years. And we can see now that EDF on all the fleet of plants they have available, the Laurents from the 60s is the cheapest plant, plant to operate and is still operating. And uh, why not the UK to take advantage and uh, create a, a serious percentage of its electricity uh, through a resource that is available uh, here in the UK. Mm -hmm. th thanks very much, Jack. I can see so many questions. But before I go to the let me, uh, I can see Bruce, you're the reason of your end. You want to ask a question? Uh, that's a question to the judge. Yes, uh, thanks very much for a um, really interesting presentation. Um, I just wondered, uh, well, there's two questions actually. I'm happy to sort of just put one and then come back for another sort of ask. But the first one is um, about the uh, situation in France where the La Rance, uh installation has been running, as you said, for 40 or 50 years. And um, why do you think the French went down the route of just installing 30 or 40 nuclear stations rather than building more tidal stations? Uh, it was uh, a period that uh, uh, we were back in the 60s uh, that uh, a number of nations were progressing with uh, nuclear. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, when although uh, that uh, the Laurens uh, was built, uh, France uh, made the decision that uh, they should go with 85% uh, nuclear. We never had that decision here in the UK. In the UK, we always went up to 25%. Uh, and uh, the reason that uh, I think uh, uh, the France uh, went to 25 to 85% is because uh, they are not an island like we are. Mm. And uh, they are uh, in uh, mainland Europe and they can uh, have uh, interconnections uh, with uh, Germany, Italy and all that. I was uh, not so long ago in uh, Paris with uh, the director, R&D and engineering director of EDF. And I was asking him the question, how does he balance his uh, system <coughs> with uh, such a percentage of uh, uh, nuclear? And uh, uh, obviously, he said, uh, whenever there is a Paris Saint-Germain Manchester United uh, game, uh, they have uh, blackouts in Milan. Uh, but uh, we don't have this uh, luxury here. We just uh, have to use our uh, Festiniog and Di Dinoric whenever there is a Liverpool Manchester City game. Uh, and uh, at the same time, you can see that even nuclear France is uh, pushing now to reduce this 85% down to 50%. Mm. And really now they are changing what they have thought before. Uh, and uh, we might see some further developments there. Okay, thank you. Can I ask my second question or do you want me to hold back and... Uh... So, sorry, Bruce, can you hold back because we have a lot of questions. Yes, there. okay. Happy I just, to I'm very sorry. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. let me, I know Richard, you put your question earlier, so I'm going to reread your question to George. So George, you, I have Richard asking, the link with the IMEC sea level rise report and the associated threat to estuaria industry mitigation is very important, useful to lobby. Okay, I think this is a comment for you. So I think it's just talking about the need to lobby the parliament, just like you finally said, okay? Yeah, uh, 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 tidal, yeah. tidal drains. Let me, let me just say a couple of words on that point then, if, uh, uh, since uh, it includes the IMA key. Uh, the IMA key a couple of years ago, it came up uh, uh, with uh, the uh, a report that states that uh, sea level rising is happening. And the conclusion of that, it said uh, uh, w within the next uh, uh, 100 years, we're going to have uh, uh, one meter sea level rise. They stated that, but plan for three meters. And this is on the IMA key report that anybody can read, it's available. Uh, Tidal barrages uh, could help with uh, uh, sea level rise and uh, uh, with uh, flood protection. Flooding is a serious issue. Uh, it's so serious that uh, uh, countries that uh, are more exposed uh, than the UK, i.e. the Netherlands, they have developed a super institution, a super ministry that links together uh, different ministries and with very strong powers to act and execute. We do not have anything like that here in the UK. Last time I was discussing with a minister at uh, the House of Parliament uh, and uh, we were trying to understand how best to help there, there is not enough communication between different ministries. Energy is dealt with one ministry, flooding is dealt with another ministry, transport is dealt with another ministry. Now, you need some way to actually link up all this together. Countries that are slightly more progressive than ours uh, in, uh, let's say, Norway, they developed uh, the north-south south 
new coastal line, bridge tunnel, bridge tunnel, all the way down, with tidal and renewables already designed from the initial stage. We have never done anything like that. We need to start having a collective thinking. In this way, instead of spending a lot of money on coastal protection that is not meeting the need because every single year we read about flooding somewhere, flooding in Carlisle, flooding in the Northwest. We see it on the media, we see it on newspapers. Uh, we can have a collective thinking and see how best to protect. Our nuclear power stations are built next to the on the coastline for cooling purposes. They need to be protected in some way, but obviously cities, train uh, railway lines, other infrastructure could be protected as well. And the IMA key through this report is really uh, try to raise the profile further and tidal rains can help significantly there in this aspect. Yeah. Thanks very much, George. Uh, okay, I can see Felix, you're raising up your hand. Can you ask just one question, please? That's so many uh, yes, very quickly. <laughs> uh, given the uh, estimated 95 pounds per megawatt hour, is there any possibility of a, a, a private investor actually coming forward and saying we're going to do this and we are not going to ask for government funding? Are you talking to people about that? Well, uh, this is a question for the developers. I'm not a developer, uh, but uh, uh, I'm sure developers are uh, looking into that. But uh, for this uh, large uh, 120 years long infrastructure, the government needs to be a bit more serious than that. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I want to ask this question from, I think it's something related to, yeah. So I have this question from Sean. He says, what is the possibility of tidal energy being paired with the production of hydrogen as a secondary fuel source? I know the government is interested in hydrogen, so he's asking, uh, that, for example, in the manufacturing of hydrogen for fuel in vehicles, okay? So, if viable, is there yeah. a way that can be peer Yeah, together? yeah, this is, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, because uh, we can uh, have uh, other uses of uh, uh, the electricity produced uh, from uh, uh, the energy used from uh, tidal barrages uh, in places where uh, we have, uh, like here at Morgan Bay, uh, offshore wind uh, uh, with intermittency. Uh, we can uh, uh, support that intermittency uh, and with some uh, uh, extra energy, we can see the resource for hydrogen is there. Uh, we can easily use it to produce hydrogen. And this is something that we really uh, looking at as part of the work we're doing at Lancaster University uh, as uh, another use of uh, the energy that would, could be produced because some of these uh, projects that uh, we are looking at are quite big. I mean, we are talking about uh, a resource, for instance, for Morgan Bay could be for an outer, uh, could be four gigawatts. Four gigawatts is like, uh, for nuclear power stations, for ASAMs, from that point of view. So uh, hydrogen is a, a very, very good idea to actually utilize it and uh, take it forward, especially with the interest that the government has shown recently on uh, uh, using hydrogen for uh, a number of uses. Thanks very much, George. I have this question from uh, from Anthony. It is a, uh, oh, sorry, from Paul Ramsey. He says, it seems that most barrages so far built are where there are no shipping routes. Would some barrages have locks for shipping, e.g. into Asia? 
uh, there is no problem with uh, uh, building uh, barrages and shipping. Uh, you can always uh, engineer solutions and uh, shipping passages around uh, uh, barrages. Uh, so uh, you see that, for instance, in Lorenz, there are boats passing through. Uh, and uh, uh, on projects that have been progressed and I'm aware of, uh, we have uh, always looked into the possibility of uh, having locks so uh, ships can pass through. So I don't think this is a problem that we cannot engineer a solution around it. Thank based you. on uh, the specifics of a, speci a, a site. Yeah. So I, I need to read this question. I think this is from a second year that got a student. I, I believe students on this uh, platform, they uh, they need to think about the future because I believe they will be the one to carry on your work, George. So this student is asking a question. How can students get involved in tidal range and stream technology, for example, seeking internships and other routes? And I could see Richard, you've answered Sean, but is there any advice you want to give to the students in terms of, you know, continuing this work you are doing? Because I know, you know, you, we could see that the government is not that showing keen interest in this type of work, but maybe students or people coming, you know, in the future will keep on pushing this. So any advice for the student, please? Yes, uh, there are a lot of students that uh, are looking into uh, the future and looking into a renewable future that uh, could uh, uh, generate uh, clean power for uh, themselves, their families, their kids, and uh, uh, and uh, they are seriously involved in that, both on the uh, civil engineering side, and they are spending quite a lot of uh, time working there. And at Lancaster University, we are looking, as you can see, both on civil engineering side, but also on the mechanical engineering side uh, and uh, uh, developing uh, further the ideas for turbines, uh, looking into new ideas. So for a uh, hundred years, let's say we had uh, 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 doubly regulated uh, Kaplan turbines. It is only since uh, 2017 and because of the needs of tidal rains, and this was the Sonji Bay project, that we developed triple regulation. Now, these are all new ideas that are coming out uh, uh, through uh, the need to come up with solutions that are fit for purpose and come from new researchers, new people coming into the industry, and they can all uh, push forward with these uh, uh, technologies. So yeah, uh, there is a great interest of uh, uh, from uh, young uh, uh, students uh, to take things forward uh, with uh, Tidal, but at the same time, as I said, the government has to be more serious and look further back, forward uh, to create the infrastructure that is required for the future and future generations here in the UK so we can live like we have lived up to now in the future. Because even if we don't do anything at uh, Morgan Bay that uh, you mentioned, nature will take its course, things will change. I'll, but with engineering, we are able to change things that could keep the situation as it is today. Mm. We can use turbines to get energy, but we can use pumps to maintain the levels for environmental protection. Thanks very much, George. I mean, we, 
your talk is so much interesting. So many questions. Unfortunately, we can't touch everything. But I've left the contact of George in case you still want to ask more questions. And yeah. I'm sorry I, if I cannot take your question. I'm very sorry. So okay. please contact George. Yeah. Um, I will hand over to you, David, uh, to round up for uh, this program. OK, thank you, George. That was a very interesting and informative lecture. I think you covered all the topics that I referred to. And thank you for that and more besides. And it really is good to hear that there is a positive solution to achieving zero carbon emissions from power generation. It just needs the will to do something about it. And like you say, the time to do it is now. I can't understand why the government are not going ahead with this. Because from what I also understand, the capital investment for these projects would be funded by the banks and the investment houses because the, the return on capital employed is guaranteed. Because as I understand it in the past, the low tides were considered for a period from a period of about 30 years. And those are the figures that have been put into the equation. So the tides are going to be generally higher than that and the power generation is going to be higher. So I cannot understand why um, they're not going ahead with it. But hopefully this lecture, and I'm hoping that the, the, the content of this lecture, the recording, I'm going to try to get it to lots of people who are in the know, including the government, to see if we can get something moving. So I am trying and I'm doing my best. We're just running a little bit over time and I don't like doing that, but uh, thank you so much, George, for the lecture. It was excellent. Can we thank George in our usual way, even though we're not face to face? Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you. Right. Thank and you. Finally, um, our next lecture is on the 6th of December and it's on the commute uh, consumer product process design which will examine the challenges and opportunities. So please come along. Thank you again for attending today. Enjoy the rem remainder of the evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Andoni. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.